Okay, we're going to go in three, two, one. Lions Lounge Lockdown, episode 26, all the way from the USA, a mill legend, Casey Keller. Casey, thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Dan. Absolutely over the moon. I'm, I shouldn't tell you this as an interview interviewer, but I'm very nervous, <laughs> which doesn't happen often. So, um, yeah, brilliant. So glad you're on. The fans are thrilled to have you on. Millwall from 1992 to 1996. Yes. 202 appearances. Um, how did it come about coming to Millwall? Well, when I was, uh, you know, kind of finishing up uh, at university uh, in, in, at home, you know, I had uh, and, you know, a lot of old uh, English players who had come over and played in NASL uh, as, as my coaching. And they kind of started to make some inquiries um, back in England with some of their old teammates, some of their old friends that they had. And they kind of said, look, we've got this this goalkeeper over here that I think you should you should have a look at. And, you know, one of those people that they contacted was Bruce Rioch, who had you know, kind of come over to the Seattle Sounders back in the day. And then when the NASL folded, he kind of stuck around for a little while, coached for a while. Um, I was, you know, I was too young. I mean, he didn't, he didn't coach me or see me play. But mm. what he did have is he had a, maybe a more of a respect for the American player than a lot of people understood because he was over here. He saw the people. Then he obviously respected the people that um, – we're reaching out to him and saying that I think this is somebody you should have a look at. And so uh, Bruce respected that and was able to then when I um, you know, finished at university, he well, I guess I I finished my season at university. And, and then, you know, I came over basically five, six days later on trial and we had kind of agreed to a month's trial and then. Really, it was after a couple of days that they kind of whispered in my ear and kind of said, look, uh, you know, we're, we're going to sign you. It's just let's let's go through the whole process and, you know, went through the process. And then uh, what I attribute to really aggressively starting my hair loss was after agreeing to the contract and then having to wait for the work permit was was kind of where I think I truly started losing my hair. Start to worry about maybe you weren't going to get to England. Yeah, that was the tough part. You know, I mean, as, as any kid, you, you know, you dream of, you know, being a, a professional. And, and then, you know, to have, you know, a, a good contract in front of me, to have a, a, a manager that believes in me and in a place where I kind of thought that, that you know, I, 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 you know, I'd been there long enough that I started to get to know a lot of the guys and, and, and we're really kind of looking forward to having that opportunity and then not being able to have that opportunity because, you know, of, uh, of I wouldn't necessarily a technicality, but just because of, you know, the way the system works, you know, would have been, you know, devastating. And so, you know, kind of the way it worked was the home office kind of came back and said, look, you know, we like you know, what you've done, you know, in your youth career and, 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 you know, you had, I think at the time I had eight or 10 caps, you know, from the national team, I'd been a part of, you know, the 90 world cup side for the, for the U S and so they, they said, what we're going to do is I think the work permit officially, I think came through on Valentine's day. So February 14th. And they said, we're going to give you the remainder of this season and one full year to prove yourself. And okay. that was kind of what they said. We're not going to give you a full work permit, but we're going to give you kind of, and it was really funny that then as the work permit process evolved, that kind of whole new system really kind of started with myself. And then how they started to then moved it to, you know, if you played, you needed to play a percentage of games or you could lose your work permit, all that kind of started with the home office and myself. And, you know, so then, you know, I knew I'd, I'd gotten the opportunity, but then the tricky part is, you know, and, and I think, you know, players get used to it, but me kind of being my first club is, you know, how often, you know, managers can move or change or get fired or, 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 you know, move on to a different club or whatever it is. And so then, you know, the guy who signed me, you know, four weeks later, you know, was fired. So then there's that whole new, you know, piece is, Okay, then Mick takes over, but then you know, okay, I was kind of training obviously with Mick coming as a player manager, but 
Mm. Uh, uh, I didn't know, you know, does, does he like me? Does he think I'm, you know, does he like me as much as Bruce? You know, what's the, what's the setup? So, you know, that had a, a whole nother level of anxiety to it. Yeah, right. So I was under the impression that you was one of Mick's first signings, but you wasn't. You was actually signed I by Bruce. Bruce Rioch, last signing, I think. Yeah, <laughs> but you, play, you would have played your first game under under Mick's reign. And it was that last game of that 91-92 season. Yeah. Uh, and, and for me, it was a great confidence booster. So, you know, I'd kind of been there long enough to to feel like I'd, I'd, I'd gotten... I wouldn't say comfortable, but that that I kind of felt like I'd been there for for long enough to understand what I was, you know, doing and what I needed to do. You know, played, I wouldn't say a number of reserve games, but definitely, you know, got my feet wet in the reserves and and, and played some matches that way. Uh, and then playing that last match, you know, winning two nil, uh, going into that uh, summer break, knowing that hey, I can do this. I can keep clean sheets. I can. You know, I can I can compete at this level was a great confidence boost. And then I went in with the national team for a while. You know, came back to preseason, thought I had a great preseason. And, you know, kind of then Mick, Mick being the great kind of, you know, young manager. Where, where I think what happens with kind of young managers is they want to be they want to treat people the way that they wanted to be treated. Yeah. And so and so Mick was very honest, very forthright. It was great. He sat me down and, you know, right before the season started and he said, look, you know, Case, by all accounts, you know, you you won the starting role, you know, over the summer. But I can't take Aiden out for not doing anything wrong. Mm. So just keep doing what you're doing. You know, just, you know, they started the season. Aiden played a league game and a cup game. And then I played every match the rest of the season. So Mick was true to his word. I kept doing well, and you know he gave me the opportunity. And and uh, and, I, and I thought it was a, it was such a fun you know to be to be part of Millwall in that last season at the old Den, and then to be a part of the new Den was was really cool. I've kind of had some of those cool experiences through my career. You know, I, my first season at Muchen Gladbach, I was able to play Bayern Munich in the old Olympic Stadium. And then played in the first league game at the new All Alliance Arena. So uh, that's how I kind of felt with Millwall, kind of having that opportunity. I, for me, it wouldn't have felt the same if I hadn't had that opportunity to play in the old then as well. Yeah, well, you, you had a phenomenal career. But we'll go back to the very beginning. A brilliant introduction to not just English football, but English life. Just being in South London and playing in Millwall Reserves. What was that? Was that a culture shock for you? Well, the first the first reserve game I played in. Uh, when I was still on trial, was against Arsenal. And the two strikers in that match were Ian Wright and Andy Cole. Wow. So it was Ian was coming back from an injury or something and needed a game, and Andy was, you know, the young player who hadn't quite broken through yet. So I remember playing in that first reserve game and, like, truly afraid to even, like, look around the stadium because I thought the game was so fast that if I even <laughs> glanced away that something would happen. And, uh, you know, so, so it was. It was just a great learning curve. And then, you know, getting that opportunity and, and you know, and then like anything, I mean, it, opportunities where it starts, but then you have to make the most of it. And, and it was nice to be able to kind of play those games because I think sometimes players get thrown into situations – that they're really not quite ready for. Mm. And then it's almost unfair that, oh, you, you didn't succeed. I thought, I thought Millwall did a great job and, and, and Bruce and Mick um, and not just saying, oh, here, go play in the first team. And, and then if you are terrible, okay, goodbye. Right. I mean, I, I, and I wasn't ready for that. Don't get me. I wasn't ready when I first got there. I needed to play, you know, a handful of games in the reserves to feel more comfortable with the speed and just the way it was played. And, you know, and then the other then the other issue that really came up and, and I think was an issue for a lot of us was, you know, that that change between that 91, 92 to 92, 93 season was the back pass rule. Yeah. And and it really was something that for you know all of us who grew up playing in goal, you would have never dreamed of playing that ball with your feet. Why would you? You know, you they just pass back to you, you pick it up, you whip it out to the other side and and go from there. So that was definitely, you know, something that that a lot of us who didn't grow up with that rule. Now there's really no excuse. Now mm -hmm. you have to have a level of confidence with your feet that 
is is just expected because and, and there's no reason why you shouldn't because from day one you know this is what the rule is but for those of us that you know i was i had just turned 22 and you know for you know let's say i started playing you know at six seven maybe exclusively in goal at you know 12 13 oh by the way now you can't pick the ball up when they pass it back to you it's a, yeah it's a little bit different and, and and definitely took some time to get used to it now i think what you're seeing is you know full generations who are used to that and and, and it almost looks like there's a field player uh who who, who gets to use his hands Mm. Well, it sounds like you, you you felt confident in your own ability and you settled in quite quickly on the pitch. What about off the pitch? What was your first impressions of the fan base, the, the den, the, the area in general? When I was when I was leaving um, to university and I, and I needed to finish some uh, some finals and, and try to finish that semester before I took off. And I had a philosophy professor professor who was Scottish and. So I kind of sat down with him and, and you know, while I am leaving, I'm, I, I'm going to England, I'm going on trial and, oh, OK, what club are you going to? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to Millwall. And this look on his face, it's like, they kill people there. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh, boy, you know, and then, then I mean, you, you get there yeah, and you, you realize that, you know, I mean, Millwall has a reputation and, and, and. And in some aspects of that reputation, it's justified. But but in other ways, I mean, and, and this is what's hard for people to understand is I played for a lot of clubs. And, yeah. and still, you know, Millwall, when it came to kind of the fan interaction, particularly, you know, maybe outside of, you know, a crazy West Ham thing or something that was just, you know, where it erupted because of whatever reason. Um, was truly some of the most friendly interaction of any club that I ever played for. And some of those examples, you know, and, and for me, who was, you know, just finishing at university, and then I had a lot of, you know, friends and different people who were maybe traveling around Europe after school and were coming through London. And, you know, it's all pre-cell phone stuff, right? So it wasn't like yeah, you know, had a number or email and could try to get a hold of you and say something. So, you know, they'd come to a match. And, and hey, oh, you're American. Oh, yeah, we're friends of Casey's. We're, you know, from school or whatever. And they would almost like, you know, take them under their wing and come with us and we'll show you where they're going to come out after the match and all this. And, and it, I mean, go try to do that. At, <clears throat> excuse me. Go try to do that at Tottenham. Go try to get to the place where you can get in to, you know, the player's car park at Tottenham or something like that. And it, and it just wouldn't happen. And and so, you know, from those experiences, you know, it was it, it was really cool. And then there was there was one interesting, you know, also experience. My wife was at the match. And, you know, before the kids, she went to a you know, she went to most of the away matches and in, in the home matches. But she was at that nil nil draw against Ipswich, Ipswich when we got relegated. And then these these guys were very nice. They were um, Mrs. Keller. I think it's time for you to leave now before we rip this stadium apart. <laughs> so. And there was there was a level of politeness, I think, with the Millwall fans that was uh, was always interesting. I treat people the way they treat me, and if you're nice to me, then I'm of course going to be nice to you. And because I've had different people at different times, and you know, you know, because obviously when, when Millwall's made it to some you know some big runs in the cup or or whatever else, and. And I'll say something on social media and somebody will, oh, how can you, you know, say things about that club and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, just go away. You know, I mean, I, I'm going to, they were the fans, the club. I said, everybody was brilliant to me. And, 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 and bar, you know, do I agree with, you know, some of the, the crazy stuff that's gone on? Of course not. But that, that has nothing to do with me. I mean, everybody's cool to me and I'm going to be cool to them. Brilliant, mate. I love the way they give your wife good fair warning. You know, best, yeah, best yeah, to go best now. To go now. Uh, you might want to just step out of this because it's it's going to get ugly. <laughs> so you, you made your debut uh, randomly. Obviously, that was before the transfer window. So there might be younger viewers thinking, how did he sign and play literally right at the end of the season? That was right. before then. Then the 92 93 season, as you said, you become a, the first team regular. 50 appearances that season. Yeah. Um, a good season under Mick McCarthy. Um, that was yeah, the, just missed the playoffs. Um, um, some great. Yeah. I thought we, we had some unbelievable home form for a stretch. 
scored a lot of goals as well, didn't we? Teams. And, you know, that was a lot of fun to be a part of, you know. And, and one thing I always remembered about those, those early seasons was, you know, it was right at the introduction of when the Premier League went to Sky. And so you'd have the London match, and the London match would outdraw the Premier League like six or eight to one because nobody had Sky and had access. And so, you know, for myself, kind of being this, you know, new into the in, into the scene, as as we would say over here, it was, um, you know, to have that much exposure, you know, particularly in the greater London area. And the team was playing so well. And so we were on a lot because we had just really entertaining games. And it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, we had Jamie Morley scored a lot of goals that year. John Goodman and um, yeah. Malcolm Balance. We scored a lot of goals that, that season. Yeah. Who was you close with? Who did you become close with in, within the squad? Well, it was really the, that that first year. Um, it, it was a, it was kind of a, a crew of us that did, you know, we kind of all lived in the same area, but it really it would be, you know, from Colin Cooper and 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 also uh, you know Aiden Davidson as well. You know, they they say that sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's always difficult for goalkeepers, mm -hmm. right? You train all the time together. You're obviously in competition, you know, with each other. And, and I think that's what I really enjoyed too about uh, about England was, you know, there, there there wasn't the pettiness that I saw in in some other places. That that there was that look, you and I can be in competition, and if we're you know, again. If, if I'm nice to him and he's nice to me, you know, yeah, we both want to play and we both want to do things. But, yeah, so we did a lot together with Etienne Vivere as well. Did, we did a lot of stuff together. And then, of course, I mean, we were always, you know, from, you know, and, and I think it really was, it was, you know, because my, my girlfriend, who then obviously became my wife, but, uh, you know, she had moved over and it was, you know, kind of that little, you know, kind of couples thing that were yeah, yeah. in the area together and, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, cause obviously we spoke to a few players from from this era, and I said there was a, there was obviously you know we spoke to Malcolm Allen, we spoke to Alex Ray, so we've heard the craziness. They right. said you know you, was, you always, if there was a team night, you always attended, but you know you wasn't really you you know you wasn't you know, luckily in the, in their bracket for craziness and drinking. But a, a, a character that fascinates me that I, I, just, I really want to try and find out as much as I can because obviously there, there was no social media back then. Was Etienne Vivier? So you were you quite Thank close God. to Etienne? <laughs> Oh man, that would have been insane. There, that's the best thing that ever happened, I think, for a lot of those footballers back in the day. That there was no such thing as social media. <laughs> Did you? Um, was you close to Betty and Vivian? Yeah, I mean, our, our uh, his girlfriend and, and and my wife. Sometimes when we were at preseason, they'd go and you know take a week holiday somewhere, and and you know they live we you know dinners at each other's homes and stuff like that. Yeah, all the time. Mm. So this season, obviously, we just missed out on the playoffs, but it was the point, uh, quite a pivotal point in the, in the club's history because we was leaving the old den and, and going to the new. Was there sort of ambition and awareness from the players that, you know, we're going to this big new stadium, big things could be happening? Sure. I mean, I, I think, and we had, you know, a, a successful year, you know, the year before and we're, you know, really probably disappointed that we didn't make the playoffs because I thought we were, we were definitely, you know, good enough to be able to do so and, and maybe even, you know, you know, push for promotion, but it didn't quite work out that way. So then, you know, I think there's always that little bit of, you know, and this is kind of in retrospect, because I was too early in my career to really kind of understand, you know, kind of what that meant, kind of yeah. leaving the old den and moving into the new stadium. And, and I think there was also this idea as well, uh, at least kind of from what I've kind of gathered over, over the years, was they kind of thought this hard, you know, working class, real, you know, I mean, let's be honest, this, this rough and tumble uh, Millwall support would kind of get a little bit more genteel in a different environment. And um, let's just say that match against Derby in the playoffs proved that that wasn't going to be the case, that <laughs> Millwall fans are still Millwall fans for, and, and uh, for good or bad, whatever you want to say, but whatever. And, 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 and it was, I mean, and it was cool, but we also respect, I mean, it was, it was nice. You know, I think it was, I think every, you, you saw this transition with, um, you know, with the different, you know, rules in place with no standing uh, uh, any, any longer and having to have all seat stadiums and, and all that. And, and it was nice to move into uh, a, a new facility and, and it made a big difference. And, you know, the 
from the changing rooms to, you know, just I'm sure the being out and, and, and trying to get uh, refreshments and, and things it just made a huge difference, I think. And, and we as players, you know, of course, we respected it. We loved it. We wanted it. And I think it was a big reason why we had as much success we had. And then and, and, and unfortunately just came up short in the playoffs. Yeah. Well, before we got to the new ground, let's talk about the the last game. <laughs> the old men. Um, yeah, exactly. You, I mean, everyone was that said the fans were absolutely over the moon. He was coming on. But the the majority of them said, got to talk about him in his pants on the last day at Bristol. Bristol Rovers. It, it, was, it was another level. I mean, and it was funny. We have a, some friends of ours who were who were London based. It was one of my my coaches at university. And let me see if I can get this right. It was his wife's sister and her husband who were living in London and they kind of became our surrogate parents. And he was a big, he was basically the vice president of Shell Oil for Europe. Okay. And, 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 you know, they, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, the sister, the, the sister-in-law, you know, the, you know, my coach was, you know, played at Cardiff and played in the, in the NASL and was a, Northern Ireland international goalkeeper. And so, you know, they, they grew up, you know, kind of, you know, watching games and, and being Portland Timbers supporters and stuff like that. So they, they had Chelsea season tickets because they lived over in that area and, but came to a ton of Millwall games. And they were there at that last game. And coincidentally, the president of Shell Oil was in town <laughs> with his wife and they came, they came to the match. And obviously it was just pandemonium from, you know, the first minute the ball went in into the crowd and never came back out to, you know, the first pit. I mean, there was, I think it was Andy Roberts at one stage in that match who was completely stripped naked in front of, <laughs> basically in front of that stand. And here's the president of Shell Oil and his wife kind of looking at each other going, oh my God, what is going to happen in this game? So <laughs> It's, and and so then obviously there was one stage I don't know if it was the first pitch invasion or the second pitch invasion but I always taped my socks on and so I'm I've been knocked over at this stage everything's been taken off of me except for my socks and a pair of shorts well there was Three people pulling in this direction to get a sock off. Three people pulling in this direction to get a, a sock off. And I think four people trying to pull my shorts back over my head. I'm actually <laughs> suspended in the air. And then finally, I'm like starting to punch people where I could. And, and some people got them off me and I was able to go in and, and change. And, and then we started back over again. So. I didn't quite um, get the full exposure of Andy Roberts, but uh, I definitely was uh, more cautious after that. What did um, what did your friends, the uh, the president of Shell, what did he, what did he say to you after the game? Was there any passing comments? Um, well, I think the thing was is because our friends who were the vice president, you know, they'd been to a ton of games, and then I think it was just trying to understand that, trying to put context into. You know how many years the fans have been in the stadium, and yeah, yeah. and then I think I think near the end they bowed out a little early to to try to get out of there. But uh, but so in the the final when we were when it was kind of the last, you know, it's near the end of the match. We'd had probably a pitch invasion with about 15, 20 minutes left in the in in, in the match, and you know so you remember how the old den was where you had. To get into the changing rooms, it was at the it was at the end. It wasn't the midfield. It was at the it was You're behind the yeah. goal. And I was in the goal at the other side. And and so when we got in the last time, you know, while they cleared the pitch and and then we found more kit to put on um, and found a few balls somewhere that weren't that, that, that I think they had to go that I think somebody had to take a, a, a car to the training ground and grab some more balls because I think we ran out at one stage and and then um, so the, so the referees had said to me they said look um, near the end of the game 
if there's a corner or a set piece deep in the other half, mm. we're going to blow the whistle and we're all just going to run into the changing room. So when you see that, you know, work your way up the field. I'm like, okay, great. Thank you. And so we're getting, we're getting near the end of the match. There's a corner or something. I'm up around midfield <clears throat> and he doesn't blow the whistle. And I'm like, well, the Millwall fans aren't stupid, right? So they're now, they're realizing, hmm, something's up here. So they're now all sitting on top of the fences. And I don't know what happened, but the ref basically got near the end of, of that section, picked up the ball, blew the whistle, and ran into the thing. And I'm looking around going, oh, no. <laughs> so, so I just start running as fast as I can. And it truly, I mean, it, it must have been a, it, it, to me, it looked like a scene out of the Ten Commandments. And you had the Red Sea was closing in on the, on the Roman soldiers or, or on the Egyptian soldiers. And I'm, and I'm running and it's getting tighter and tighter. And then I got, I got to about the top of the 18. And I remember this big guy jumps in front of me. And I have just all these things scrolling through my head. And I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do here? And my first thought was, I'm just going to lower a shoulder and just crush this guy. And then I'm thinking, well, if he goes down too easily and I stumble and fall over him, I'm done. There, I'm just getting piled on. So I, I decided I would jump, kicked him in the chest, he kind of stumbled back. I landed on my feet. I got around him. And then there was just a, a, a semicircle of, of riot police in front of the entrance into the locker room. And I just dove through the police and got into the, uh, in, into the changing rooms. But you, you said all that with a smile on your face. It's absolutely brilliant. It's really, <laughs> really we, we do a lot of these. And for, for players that come on and haven't seen the show, you know, we do like to hear about the games. But... We haven't really spoke about football yet, and this is brilliant. This is all the stuff that people want, people want <laughs> to hear. I played American football, so I had no – I mean, I was ready to throw a shoulder or do – I was cool. The only problem was is, is just if you get – I'm okay one-on-one. -on -one. It was the problem if I, if I stumbled and 10 guys jumped on me, it didn't, didn't do me a lot of good. No, no. So uh, everlasting memories of the last day at the old den. Um, and then we move into the new den for the 93-94 season. Again, you make 51 appearances. Uh, let's talk before the season starts. This is one that I, I put in my notes. Uh, uh, before this point, the 93-94 season, you were sort of, if you want to say, the standalone sort of import. We didn't really bring many players over back in that day. But right. this season, you know, we started seeing an influx of, well, all sorts from this point, Australians, later on Russians, Scots. Sure. But the first goal scorer for the first ever goal at the new den was John Kerr, a fellow American. I don't remember, John Kerr has a, had, a, had, a, had a Scottish passport, so... He has yes, he's goals. American, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll claim him. It's okay. I mean, I'll make sure that I See, always, you know... This is stuff sure. that just... What, is that Spanish, this is stuff that you just... You, you <laughs> don't get... So you, this is stuff you don't get on Wikipedia or back in the day from the Millwall fanzines. John Kerr had a Spanish passport. That's just blown my mind. Scottish passport. Oh, Scottish. Yeah. Right. He's okay. Scottish. So he had uh, he had a British passport. So he uh, and and so did Bruce Murray. So it was it wasn't. But yes, they were American, but uh, they they weren't American like me. They didn't have to go through the work permit process or right. deal with that kind of stuff. It's funny because I, I spoke to Jason Van Blurk this morning. Actually, we interviewed Jason Van Blurk this morning, nice. and he was saying about the the problems with work permits and exactly what you said. Um, so he actually got to Millwall. Because Dave Mitchell asked Mick McCarthy if he could come over for a trial. So I was the question I was leading to, you know, was there any involvement from you and John Kerr coming to the club? Um, no, John came on trial. He was he was playing at Woking, I think. Right. And <clears throat> excuse me, and somebody spotted him, one of the scouts spotted him at Woking oh. and then um, came over on trial. And then it was like, you know, obviously why he's there on trial. We're I mean, I didn't know John at that stage. Um, but then, you know, we obviously became, you know, great friends and, and, and still talk today. But uh, but yeah, so it wasn't it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that uh, that I had said. And I wouldn't have had the um, obviously Dave Mitchell, who was 
you know, mid thirties and, and been around the block is, is in a more comfortable position to say to a manager, you know, Hey, you know, have a look at this guy. I mean, obviously later in my career, I would have felt very comfortable doing that. But at that stage, no, it was just coincidental that, that John had, had, had kind of come over. And then it truly was one of those situations where, you know, once he signed, you know, I think he ate dinner at my house almost, you know, probably five times a week. I mean, it was, you know, because whenever you're cooking, you know, it was my, my wife and I, and then whenever you're cooking, you know, to have one other person, you pretty much have that much food left over anyway. Mm-hmm. And, you know, John by himself, you know, before his his girlfriend then became his wife came over, it was, yeah, just, hey, come on over and just, yeah, just came over almost every night. So he, he scored the first ever goal uh, at the night, obviously the first night of the new den against Bobby Robson's sport in Lisbon. And a young yeah. Louis Fico played that night. What, what was your memories of that night? Well, I mean, I think it was a, it was a great uh, you know preseason game for us to to get prepared. And I think anytime you you know, and particularly for myself who who didn't have you know at that stage in my career you know that kind of experience. Yes, I had games with the national team and being able to do that, but but to play against some some clubs like that and and to be competitive and to you know, and it, it, it's always, you know, one more experience. And, and, and I thought it was fantastic. And I thought the, the crowd was great. And, and, and obviously Bobby Robson, you know, was, a, was such a great, a great man. And, and it really was a, a, a fun event because I don't think, you know, when, when, you, when you think about Millwall, you know, you don't think about, oh, let's let's have a game against Sporting Lisbon. Right. So so to have those kind of events was was really cool. And I think and then, you know, extrapolating that later when I did end up going to Leicester and, and, and playing in the Premier League and, and getting that opportunity in the Premier League, I had played against, you know, a majority of the Premier League sides, either in cup competitions or in a in a friendly or in, you know, and so I didn't feel like. You know, when when I did go, that that it really was something that I hadn't experienced yet because of 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 the cup runs that we had in the in the preseason matches that we had against against quality opposition. Mm. Well, again, this is this turned out to be a good season. We'll get on to the the finale again, which ended <laughs> up with more people running around on the pitch in their pants. But um, let's start with um, at that point during the season. It's, it's a very interesting time for the club. Some, some legends at the club, including yourself, Keith Stevens, and, and the like, but then some, it, was, it was very diverse. And it almost, right. I sort of broke it down into groups. You had the USA group, obviously yourself, John Kerr, Bruce Murray joined later that season. Then you had the youngsters of Mark Beard, Ben Thatcher, uh, Andy Roberts and Mark Kennedy. And then I've got um, Loons, which is short for Lunatics, Gavin Maguire, Terry Herlock, Pat Van Den Howen, and uh, Keith Stevens again in that in that yeah, group. Right. It falls in a lot of those categories, but uh, but... But no, no, no question about it. I mean, I think one of the things that I remembered is, and, and I tell this story sometimes when, particularly if I'm talking with, you know, kind of either old English players or, or fans who kind of know the, you know, know the leagues well, and, you know, would talk about that season where truly I'd have in front of me, you know, the two center backs in, in Rhino and, and, and Pat, and then, you know, Terry Erlock in front of them. I didn't have a lot of one-on-ones to save at that, at that season because there wasn't a lot of people coming right down the middle. They kind of tried to go around the outside a little bit. And, uh, but, but I think the things that people, I think, get away from, obviously, the, you know, the, the physicality of those players. But they're good players, too. You know, guys that, 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 that liked to, to pass the ball, that were – that you know, for as for as hard as Rhino, you know, was, he was a good footballer. Pat Van Den Howe was a good footballer. Terry Erlock was a good footballer. You know, stick Andy May in that midfield with Andy Roberts as well. That's a good footballing midfield that could that could also didn't have trouble looking after themselves either. Yeah, um, we, so we we spoke to so Mark Beard, Kenny Cullen, and Malcolm Allen, Jamie Morey, John Goodman. We spoke to a lot of the boys, and they all seem to have. So a uh, Pat Van Den Howe story. <laughs> so I was wondering if, any, if there's any experiences you had with Pat personally at the training ground or anything like that that you could share, or f- things that stick out in your mind. I think, I think one of my favorite stories about Pat was, was probably uh, at least a month probably into the time that he was there. He's, he, he, we're, we're playing in a match, and I don't know, I think Bruce Murray had come on as a sub or something like that. And... And Pat's like yelling at Bruce 
but he's like yelling at him by his number because he didn't know his name. So he was like, number seven, number seven. And, and, and Bruce is like looking around going, what is, is he talking to me or whatever? <laughs> but I remember the time when, when something had happened with Pat and, and obviously his, 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 his life off the field. And I think he hid in somebody's car boot to leave the training ground because paparazzi were trying to get photos of him or something. And you just, which I think later, you know, when I played for Tottenham or, you know, different things, you, you kind of, and you had bigger personalities, you know, mm. so you, you, you were kind of more used to that. But at Millwall, where you weren't used to somebody who had to kind of hide from the paparazzi. Yeah, but he, he sort of came from that, didn't he? He was, he was at Everton at Spurs, right. and he was sort of on his way down, in effect, when he right. when he came to Millwall. And, but, uh, and Smith stuff and everything. So yeah, it was it was just a little bit uh, a little bit different, I think, for the majority. Yeah. There wasn't a whole lot of paparazzi, you know, looking for Malcolm Allen or or Keith Stevens. So <laughs> I just again just going back to what you just said, just a story there where you've. The interaction with Pat Manden Howe and Bruce Murray he's shouting his number. It's just I just love stuff like that. It's just brilliant. Yeah. It was such, at points in the nineties Mill was just it was just so random. Just like, oh, the sheer oh, amount, the sheer amount of players in and out of the door as well from the time right. he was there. It's just unbelievable. Um Big Mick is my next question. I just wanted yep. to um just ask you what it was like for you as a man manager. And yep. did you have trouble understanding his accent? Oh, a little bit, yes. I mean but <laughs> when you think of guys like you know, John McGinley and John McGlashan and stuff and Alex and yeah, mixed accent was easy. There was no problem there. Trying to understand those Scottish guys, they might as well have been speaking Spanish. I mean, it, it's uh, that's a whole nother level for an American. Um, luckily, I had a my roommate in college was Canadian, but his his parents were Scottish. And so, you know, even even speaking with his dad, who had the hardest time when he would come down and you know, come to America and, you know, come to a match because truly um, it was like he had to repeat himself like three times for anybody to understand what he was saying. So I can only imagine, you know, for myself and just, yeah, it was crazy. But Mick, no, ton of respect for Mick, still do. Um, uh, I liked him as a, as, a, as a manager. I liked him as a man manager. He was, you know, honest with me. He was, everything he told me was, you know, there was no case where he was, you know, telling me something just to make me happy. It was like, no, I'll be forthright. And, you know, we played well under him. You know, I, I you know, Ian Evans, Taft, brilliant, you know, first team coach, uh, did just a, a ton of respect for that whole setup and was 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 great for myself in, in you know, because, yes, Bruce signed me. But but it was it was really Mick who I played under and and. Uh, and, and it, it couldn't have been better. Yeah. Well, we have a good season in the in the new stadium. The first season, we finish third and we make the playoffs and lose to Derby over two legs. We frustratingly finish sixth in the division. And don't, yeah, let's, let's talk about Derby in the playoffs. That, sure. The, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think um, you know we didn't play particularly well up there and put ourselves in a bit of a hole, and and, and that made it difficult. And and you know, I thought. You know, again, I think when you're talking about the championship, it is. It, when you talk about those four teams in the playoffs, sometimes it just – you need something to click, right? And, and it just didn't quite work out for us. But they always say that the last thing that the London police want is a match at Millwall where there's no other games going on. Um, this is the way I would explain it to people is if you're looking for a fight – Somebody at Millwall will accommodate you. And, and I think you would have individuals who weren't necessarily interested in either, you know, the, the, seeing Millwall or seeing Darby. They just realized that this is an opportunity for me to go somewhere and cause some trouble. And, and, and somebody will uh, will take me up on that offer. And and I think that's kind of what happened and, and, and at that stage when. You know, the match was over and there was really no consequences for us or for our fans or anything. And and yeah, it, it got a little ugly. And I think the the BBC Derby realized that that maybe wasn't the smartest thing to drive their car down with all that logoing and park that in the parking lot. Um, I hope they were well insured. <laughs> 
Oh, you, you said it all there without actually saying it. That was brilliant. Well done. Um, so, yeah, obviously the disappointment of that season, we lead into the 94-95 season, which you play 54 times. Uh, joint top appearance holder that year of Andy Roberts. Yeah. Um, now, the 94-90 season, 94-95 season, sorry, I'm with it now, will always be remembered for the FA Cup run, of course. Right. But before we get into that, something I didn't remember, I had a little look earlier, you were actually sent off at Sunderland in the League Cup. In a handball outside the box. Oh, is that what it was? I didn't think it would be for anything. And it was late. It was like it was like one of those ninety, you know, eighty something minutes. You know, we kind of it was it was truly, if I remember it correctly, it was a ball. I think we may have been pushed up for a goal kick, and I think I hit a goal kick, and then we we were a little bit out of position, and they broke through, and then I kind of came outside the box and. And then ended up, we ended up winning the game and, and I think it was, and then, but I, but I did, the only game I missed that year was because of that, of that red card. Yeah. Well, let's get on to it. Then. The 90, the 94, 95 FA Cup run is um, historic in the club's history. Arsenal, Chelsea, and then frustratingly knocked out by Queens Park Rangers. But let's start with the Arsenal game. Right. Um, obviously drew nil nil at home. Right. Did you have a little bit of an incident with Ian Wright in the, in the replay? I I. I didn't have an incident with Ian Wright. I think I took a ball off his feet and he kind of two footed me. Mm. And, 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 and one of our fans didn't appreciate it very much <laughs> and then decided to come out of the stand and let Ian Wright know that he didn't appreciate him two footing me. So, yeah. Well, um, hey, what's your memories that night? I love it. I mean, I mean, look, I mean, I don't condone a fan coming on the field but i love that you know that they wanted to look out for me yeah of course 100 percent, mate you're one of our own obviously that's that's what happens at me all <laughs> but um yeah let's talk about the, the replay probably the biggest night in the club's history uh recent history definitely the two nil win at highbury would you remember that night um yeah i remember we played really well i mean i i, I don't you know, I, I remember, you know, I, I don't remember having to make a bunch of saves. Right. I mean, I remember, you know, that, that, yeah, I mean, I mean, I made it, I mean, I mean, I'm sure I made a couple saves and some crosses and some things like that, but I remember us playing so well and, and thoroughly deserving to win that match two nil. And, and uh, I remember Mark Beard scoring and I remember the story, I think my wife was sitting, you know, close to Beardy's family. And he said, just the, the tears coming off of his family, you know, when he scored the goal is, you know, those are the things that is super cool. And, and uh, did Kennedy score? Who scored the other goal? Kennedy scored. Yeah. Right at the end. Yeah. I thought Mark scored again. So yeah, it was cool. So just, just great to have, you know, that. And, and again, I mean, it just kind of showed you that, that the quality of the side we had, I mean, that was a good Arsenal team, you know? And so to be able to, you know, keep two clean sheets, to be able to then go and 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 win that game with style, uh, and 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 then to be able to you know have another London derby against Chelsea in the next round. Well, let's get on to that one. That's, that was obviously personally, you know, you're a team player, but to to come away the hero that night <laughs> in the replay. Obviously, the first game nil nil at the Den on the twenty eighth of January nineteen ninety five. That was because I remember it was my fifteenth birthday. Nice. Um, yeah, and then the Man. replay. I wasn't allowed to go. My dad wouldn't let me go. So I listened yeah. on Capital Gold, but obviously we've all seen it since. Let's talk through that night. Another another nutty turnout. <laughs> well, yeah, but another another match where again I, I didn't really necessarily feel that you know that I had to. I mean, I remember playing a cup game for Leicester at Chelsea, um, where I had to make a hell of a lot more saves than I had to uh, in that game, and so so it, it, you know one of those situations where. Okay, we we get down to penalties, and I think like any time, you as a goalkeeper, you'll you'll have the odd time where you'll make three or four saves, but most of the time it's about making one save. Mm. Uh, and but what you need is you need your teammates to score the other five goals. And you know, so for myself, my teammates set it up perfectly well you know, for myself to be able to make that last save against, against uh, John Spencer. And what was funny was then, you know, I was able to make the save and, you know, the, 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 you know, the team celebrate and then the craziness that ensued after that. But years later, when I'm playing for Seattle, 
And our biggest rival, rivals are the Portland Timbers. And the coach of the Portland Timbers is John Spencer. I always made sure that our press department had a clip of uh, of, of 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 who uh, of who I saved that penalty from in that match. Oh, brilliant! What was you thinking that night when he when he stepped up? Did you obviously was you aware that you know I saved this one and we're through sort of thing? Did you guess oh, yeah, where you was you. going? Did you decide early or? No, I, I mean I think it's just uh, look the, the 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 best part. You know, goalkeeper is such a terrible position and and but the one opportunity you know that you truly have where the pressure's not on you where you can just go out and you know try to make a save and and see if uh you know see if you see if it can make the difference and and so you it really is you know you're kind of playing cat and mouse and are you going in one direction another direction and hey i guessed right put it in a spot where i could save it and i was able to come up with the big save for the for the club and john spencer of course now has to score and he doesn't and no wall go through casey keller ends as the hero the first save and john spencer chelsea's top scorer this season is the unlucky man you had to make another quick dash off the pitch that, that night. Because still, I watched the footage earlier, and you see you sort of running off celebrating, and then you see just see Dave Mitchell go over. Right. And you sort of go, oh, and then you all sort of... The Chelsea right. fans obviously it, came on behind, it, didn't they? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. But I, it, it, I don't know. I mean, it was funny. Again, it wasn't until I got to Leicester that... You know, I remember... I don't know. I was there maybe a couple of weeks. We're coming back from a, a match, and... and you know, somebody starts asking me about my time at Millwall or something, and, and somebody had said something like, oh, you know, had you ever been involved in a pitch invasion? And I'm kind of looking around going, I mean, I, I thought everybody had like four or five pitch invasions a season. I didn't realize that that was kind of, and I, I don't think I'd been in another one since I left <laughs> left, left Millwall. But, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, I, I kind of thought, oh, you know what? being my first club, being just, it was just what I was you just I thought was that just, was normal. You thought that was all part and just, parcel of it. You know, and, and it wasn't like I was ever afraid. I mean, I remember we're playing, I remember we're playing South End and in a cup match, I think, at South End. And the, the, the ball was down at the other end. I was standing probably on the penalty spot or at the top of the 18 or something like that. And, you know, I kind of see something out of the corner of my eye. And you know, I know, I see this guy. So most of the Millwall fans were at my left, kind of in a, in, a, in a section, not behind the goal, but kind of on the left side. Mm -hmm. Well, next thing you know, there's a guy that, that kind of comes running and he's kind of in front of me. He's maybe about 15, 20 yards in front of me. And I remember him running by and he's like, all right, Case, how you doing? And he kind of runs by. Well, there was a fight going on and the police had kind of, and, and, and had kind of blocked off the fans. He comes running from the main stand across the pitch and then tackles the police from behind where they can't see him and starts fighting with the Millwall fans. And I was just, I was like, oh, how's it going? Yeah, I mean, so I, <laughs> it wasn't even like I was afraid or worried or it was just, oh, okay, there he goes. Oh. He's going to go across and fight the police. All good. Absolutely brilliant. I love the way he stopped off on his way just to, just to yeah, acknowledge yeah, him yeah, first. I just stopped by, said hey, and then, uh, and then kind of went by and finished his job. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, ironically, it was a penalty that knocked us out of the cup in the next round against a club yeah. who probably wasn't after the two victories we had. Although QPR, I think they QPR finished third. Good. That, they had a good side. Third that year in the in the top division. So yeah. yeah, they were a good side. I mean, I mean, I, and, and I, I later I played with them with with Les Ferdinand and you know, ton of respect for Les and just what a great player he was. And that was a that was a good QPR side. But yeah. uh, but I agree with you. I mean, it was it was kind of almost a little anticlimactic. Obviously, you know, beating Arsenal, beating Chelsea, and then losing to QPR. But uh, still, brilliant, brilliant cup run. Yeah, it was a brilliant cup run. Um, I think our league form su suffered as a result of that. And then the ninety five ninety six season, which was your last season at the club, is when unfortunately it must it started going. Um, tits well, up, but, say in England. <laughs> yeah, no, for me it really it was it was. You know, I mean, when, you know, when Mick left for the Ireland job, mm. 
we were in second place. Yeah. You know, I mean, we we had played we had played that match at Birmingham, which was first against second, second against first, whichever way it was, and then and then that got a little bit crazy. Yeah. Um, but but I truly believe if 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 Mick hadn't left, um, you know, I think we would have if, if we wouldn't have made the playoffs, we would have been real close. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, look, I've I, I don't disparage people, but but Jimmy Nickel just did not have the you know what it took at that stage no and, and that was just a disaster yeah well let's, let's start the season off so obviously um we lost kenny cunningham and john goodman and andy roberts by this point so we lost some good players some good young talent they obviously all went on all three of them to wimbledon i think Correct. Uh, with, with the money mick bought uve fuchs chris malkin i think bobby barry ricky newman came in um what was he like as a character uve fuchs did you have much dealings with him uve, great uve we did a lot of stuff together and uh, uh I remember I had a friend of mine um, was over from the States and, and he was a, he was a very successful businessman. And I remember we were out to dinner one night and he was, I think he was offering Uwe like a hundred thousand dollars to stop smoking, I think was one of the things. And, and Uwe is like, no, no, I'm, I'm, I can't stop smoking. <laughs> so, I mean, Uwe was a, was true that, that kind of that old school classic German, uh, you know, great guy, truly yeah. great guy. Just uh, maybe it just didn't quite click for him, you know. Mm-hmm. Scored a few goals, I remember, but uh, but but uh, you're right. I mean, it was it was kind of a shift, right? In in kind of the the playing, and I, and I think I think it also was one of those things where, yeah, Mick did bring in some players, and maybe Mick, you know, understood a little bit better, you know, kind of how to play those guys, and yeah. and, and, and Jimmy Nickel, it just it just didn't happen. Yeah, I can't believe Uwe, Uwe Fuchs was on Forty Fags today. No wonder he didn't score many goals for us. <laughs> I don't know how much he was on, but uh, he definitely liked to uh, liked a cigarette for sure. Uh, just before Mick left, so he was top of the league at Christmas. He brings in the Russians. Now everyone, again, for everyone that's got a, a Pat Van Den Hal story, they've got two Russian stories. Just yeah. just had a, a interpret with them at times. Always in the dressing room, they were refusing to get on a coach to games and. Driving down the old Kent Road, drunk. They, 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 they refused to get on the coach to reserve games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they kind of. I remember one. They got. They kind of got on the. Uh, got on this coach, you know, because I think I don't think they understood. They just thought, oh, I had a match tonight, you know, not knowing that it was a reserve match, and kind of got on there and looked around and saw who was on the on the coach and realized it wasn't the first team, and were like, oh no, okay, thanks. <laughs> Did you have much to do with them? Well, obviously, they're English. I, I, I went out with them one night because one of their agent at the time was a former uh, American international huh? named Shep Messing, who was the goalkeeper for the New York Cosmos back in the day with Pele and Beckenbauer and that crew. And so he was over, and you know, we went out to dinner. And I mean, at, at this stage, you know, it was like the, you know, the Russians, you know didn't under you know it was kind of one of those things where they never knew if communism was going to come back and and the state was going to take all their money away mm. so basically they spent every every dime they had and those guys those guys yeah they had a good time with their money <laughs> to put it that way <laughs> they knew how to party yeah, oh, so, yeah. big mick leaves for the island job and then after that yeah like you said mate it is just complete free fall jimmy nickel comes in yeah um, again, a lot of stories on Jimmy Nichols manager, not not many of them good. A lot of people said that he was just too close to the players, just going out with the players at most nights and letting them do what they wanted. And well, I, I remember I remember a story that was just you know it, for whatever reason you know maybe we we had lost kind of a you know a little bit of the the defensive grit that we had with Mick. And I, and I remember saying something one time to him, you know, about, you know, should we, you know, work with the back four, you know, the week before the match and, you know, get some understanding and, you know, work on defending some set pieces or something, whatever it was. And I remember him looking at me and going, uh, well, I mean, if, if we worked on the back four, then people would figure out who was playing at the weekend 
and, and what would be the motivation for the guys who realize they're not playing? And I was like, so you're more worried, you're more worried about the guys that aren't playing than the starting four that need to get a result on Saturday. Yeah. All right. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah so I was just like, all right. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, so, and then I remember going into that last match, you know, at Ipswich and, you know, still, once again, you know, we hadn't actually fallen into the relegation zone at all no. until that last match. And it was still one of those things where you needed so many results to go against us. You needed, <clears throat> you know, for us not to get a result uh, or, or, or we had to win to guarantee it. And then even, you know, a draw would probably do it. But it was like every result went against us. You know, we didn't quite come up with it, but I just remember myself and just kind of thinking, you just do whatever you can, you know, to help this team, help this club, you know, not go down. And, you know, I was just for, I was just proud that, you know, that I was able to, to, you know, I remember I, I made a lot of saves in that match as well. And so to try to do whatever I could to, to keep a clean sheet. And unfortunately, you know, we just couldn't get a goal. Did you realize at this point that it was going to be your last game for the club or? No, I had no idea. You know, I mean, I was, I was still under contract and, you know, I mean, I didn't leave. I mean, I wasn't sold until, you know, six days before the season started. So, uh, uh, I, I, I was, I was off with the national team. You know, I came back, uh, I played a couple preseason games, one of them against Liverpool. I played a half against Liverpool. Um, and then just, yeah, I was, I, again, you you have no control. I wasn't going to come out and demand a transfer or anything. I was just going to, you know, if it, if whatever happened happened, and and, uh, and and then like I said, then right at the end, I was I, I was sold to Leicester. Yeah, well, how did that come about? Did you, was did they did they let you know there was interest, or did they just say you're going to Leicester? No, or? no, it was it was just look, you know, I uh, I think Graham Hortop was the the secretary of the club and I'd gotten a phone call that basically just said, we did, we've agreed terms with Lester and, you know, you, you're going to get a phone call and, you know, organize, you know, meeting up there to, to agree personal terms. And so, yeah, so I headed up, I think that night stayed at a hotel and then, and then, you know, started uh, the talks with, with Martin O'Neill um, after that. Yeah, we went on, mate. You went on to have a brilliant career. How did that feel, though, on, on reflection? You know, all the good times at your first club, Millwall, to, to, in effect, end it with relegation. Yeah, it was horrible. I mean, and, and considering you know the the dichotomy of that season, as you mentioned, around Christmas being at the top of the league, mm. and then just you know having that change, and it, it just was surreal because we were we were such a much better side to to then to to have it go that horribly wrong. And so, yeah, it was extremely frustrating. And, you know, that's why I'm just happy that, you know, the clubs, you know, over the years, of, you know, I think they bounced back down, you know, one more time, but, but for the most part have, have had some, some stability in the championship, some great cup runs. Uh, so yeah, I've been, been, been proud of the club, but obviously, you know, disappointed at the way that, that it finished, you know, for myself. Yeah, mate, you can generally honestly get the feel that you still, you know, you hide the, hold the club in high regards to. You've got a lot of feelings for it. 100%. Yeah, yeah always um, will, you know. So I always end by asking if you've got any standout memories you could give us. I know you were there, you had some great times and you had some semi naked times running around the pitch getting chased <laughs> by people. But if you could have a, probably a standout memory or two from your time at the club. Well, I mean, there's so many. I mean, I, I, I don't even know if I can remember enough of them, but, you know, from, from, I remember a situation, you know, from, like you said, you talk about the, the, you know, the lunacy of, of some of the things and we, we referred to a few of it. I mean, we had, I remember we were at the training ground one time and, and it's, there's, for, you know, one of those rare weeks where there's three, four inches of snow that happened. And, you know, next thing you know is Gavin McGuire was injured but as we're kind of moving somewhere, we cleared some snow off an area. And the next thing you know, Gavin McGuire comes riding a bicycle naked through the snow. And I remember just chasing him down and tackling him off the, 
off the bike so he would be naked in the snow. Um, you know, I mean, and there's just <laughs> story after story after story. But for the most part, it is is just, you know, it was my first club. They gave me an opportunity. Um, you know, I had, you know, some some great success, obviously disappointed, you know, with the way that last season finished. But but I will always, you know, hold the club and the fans for the in high regard for the way they treated me, uh, the respect that I had, how well they treated my family and friends when they came over. And, uh, you know, like I said, always uh, great, great memories. Brilliant, mate. Listen, I'll... I want to keep you all night, but obviously <laughs> you're probably a busy man. So I will finally ask, which I always ask at the end, if you could go tomorrow and have one night out with three of your ex Millwall teammates, who who would it be? There's no way I could choose three. Uh, I, I would I would love to, again to, you know, some at some stage. I'm never going to repeat this story publicly, but Rhino's testimonial. Old Kent Road, Gin Palace, <laughs> Mountain Allen did something that is truly legendary. And you're not going to hear it from me. So if you can get somebody else to tell you the story, that's not great. But uh, things that truly mind-boggling. Mind-boggling for a young American coming over. <laughs> Casey, honestly, mate, it's, it's exceeded all my expectations. It's been unbelievable. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Legend. Thanks a lot, mate. Thanks, pal.